So good day. The acetabuloplasty is a simple procedure designed to stimulate the growth of a dysplastic acetabulum, and it is performed alongside an open reduction. And it takes less time to perform than it will for me to give this talk. The procedure was developed by my predecessor in Southampton, Nick Clark, who many of you may know, and it was actually based on a acetabuloplasty described in Beijing in the 1980s. Our technique has been published, but this was only a two-year follow-up. But we have now been performing this at Southampton for 12 years. Uh, it's been taken on by a number of other institutions, including here at NYU. So I can now describe the technique, and I can report on our 12-year follow-up, which is uh, on the first 100 cases with a minimum follow-up being out to four years. All of these children were aged between one and two and a half years old at the time of surgery, and most were IHDI, <laughs> i.e. high dislocations. So first, the open reduction is done as a standard, and the capsulography as well. Then the idea is to get this little calcium sulfate pellet into the lateral aspect of the acetabulum. And all you need is this mini osteotome set with the osteotomes ranging from between two and eight millimeters in width, uh, giving this uh, final post-operative image. So here is an intraoperative photograph of a right hip. So the baby's head is across to the left and the right hip is up flexed, reduced, and the capsulography performed. You can see the ileum, the apophysis split, uh, and the two osteotomes in. So the larger osteotome, the eight millimeter one, is placed in the mid-axial line, just on the lateral aspect of the acetabulum, and you can see the entry point here. And it is advanced uh, about halfway across the acetabulum, which is usually about a centimeter, as you can see here. And then I uh, place thumb on the lateral aspects of the ileum. Uh, well, I place a second osteotome uh, anterior, directly parallel, and uh, uh, directly anterior. And then with the two osteotomes, just uh, move them slightly cordially uh, to open the wedge. Uh, and you can see the subtle difference here of the osteotome position and the wedge opened. So I will then take out the anterior osteotome and the little calcium sulfate pellet, which measures three millimeters in, in height and place that into the, uh, into the opened wedge. Now by holding the wedge open, with the posterior uh, osteotome still there. And then this is just tapped into place and is very stable. You see, tap, 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 uh, in it goes. And uh, remove the posterior osteotome. Sorry, the slide's taking a little while for the photos to move through. Now remove the posterior osteotome. You can see the little uh, calcium sulfate pellet and it gives this post-operative x-ray view, which you can see is a far from fully corrected acetabulum. So as an example, here is a girl with bilateral high dislocations, and she had sequential hip open reduction, capsulography acetabuloplasties from one year of age, uh, about staged about four months apart. And this is the first post-operative x-ray in clinic, uh, which is about eight months following the, the left hip and four months following the right. And you can see the acetabulum is still clearly dysplastic, but you can see there's evidence of where we've been with the, oste with the uh, osteotomy and evidence of growth. And the left side is a little bit ahead of the right because it was performed four months earlier. And then by about a year, the growth is really firing up and the acetabulums are coming over. And then you see the acetabuli continue to develop uh, out at three years uh, postoperatively and at five years postoperatively and at seven years postoperatively. And this girl is now eight years old charging around normally and playing all sports. So of the 100 hips here from minimum four years, so four to 12 year follow-up, 94 of these have a seven, one or two, a good or excellent outcome, uh, which speaks volumes for the center edge angle of these hips. Two of the 100 hips have come to later pelvic osteotomy. One of these was a, cell, a shelf for a salvage procedure for one of the less good outcomes, the higher several numbers. And uh, only one was for a uh, isolated residual dysplasia and she had a pelvic osteotomy. So if we look at this graph here of the normalization of the acetabular indices. So the mean 
starting acetabular index was around was 40 degrees. And at the first post-operative x-ray in clinic, it's a little bit corrected. It's about 30 degrees. So it's partial correction just by opening the wedge, but uh, cl still clearly dysplastic and far from the finished product. The red line is the uh, contralateral normal hip. Uh, and you can see after about five years follow-up, the acetabular indices have become uh, practically indistinguishable. And the main difference is three degrees at that point. Now you might say that uh, you might say that this is the uh, you might say that this is the uh, uh, natural history after having uh, getting a hip reduced. But we know from this meta-analysis from Oxford that if you do nothing to the acetabulum after a hip open reduction, then sixty percent will have residual acetabular dysplasia and come to pelvic osteotomy, and that uh, that number can be as high as ninety percent after closed reduction. So clearly, this acetabular plasty is doing something. So in, in summary, this uh, after you have sweated your way through a hip open reduction, this procedure is simple and quick. It is less invasive than a formal pelvic osteotomy. And as you've seen, it is at least as effective. So after now being a 12-year follow-up, we can confidently recommend this simple technique to be performed routinely alongside hip open reduction. And we've come to turn this uh, an open reduction capsule or an acetabuloplasty or an orca procedure. And thanks to my surgical colleagues and the medical students who have done the lion's share of the data collation for this. Thank you.